What's imagination? Does it require the past? Does it require the future? Does it require memory? Does it? Yeah, so imagination. Or, I, I does it only exist in the moment? So imagination is pro well, ooh, yeah, probably it's an instantaneous readout of what's going on. You can maybe your some, your subconscious brain has been generating all the all the bits for it, but no, imagination occurs when you in your game engine you you remember the past and you integrate sensory the present and you try and work out what you want to do in the future and then you go and make that happen so the, the imagination is this it's like imagine asking what imagination is about asking what surfing is you, you can see you can surfboard surfer wave coming in when you're on that wave and you're surfing that's where the imagination is I think I think imagination is just accessing things that aren't the present moment in the present moment. So like I can I'm sitting here and I'm looking at the table and I can imagine the river and things or whatever it was. And so it seems to be that it's like it's our ability to access things that aren't present. But to conjure up worlds, some of them might be akin to something that happened to you recently. So right, but they don't have they don't have to be things that actually happened in right. your past. And I think this gets back to assembly theory. Like the way I would think about imagination from an assembly theoretic standpoint is I'm a giant causal graph. Um, and I exist in a present moment as a particular configuration of Sarah. And but there's a a lot of uh I carry a lot of evolutionary baggage. I have that whole causal history and I can access parts of it. Now, when you talk about getting to something as complex as us, having as large an assembly space as us, there's ways of, like, there's a lot of things in that causal graph that have ever actually never existed in the past history of the universe, because, like, the universe got big enough to contain the three of us in this room <laughs> in time, but not all the features of each one of us individually have come into existence as physical objects we would recognize as individual objects. This goes back to your point that we actually have to explain why why things actually even look like objects and aren't just a schmear of mess. Um, and just on the, the free will and physics thing, when you were talking, I, was, I, I just want to bring this up because I think it's a really interesting viewpoint that Nicholas Jizen has that um, you know, like we want to use the laws of physics and then say you can't have free will. And his point is you have to have free will in order to even choose to set up an experiment to test the laws of physics. So in some sense, free will should be more fundamental than physics is to because to even do science, there's some assumption that the agents have free will. And I always thought it was really perplexing that um you know, physics wants to remove agency because the idea that I could do an experiment here on this part of Earth and then I can move somewhere else and prepare an identically, you know, identically prepared experiment, run an experiment again, seems to imply something about the structure of our universe that is not encoded in the laws that we're testing in those experiments. So this kind of dream of physics that you can do multiple experiments, different locations, and then validate each other, um, you're saying that's uh, that's an illusion no, yeah. I'm saying that requires decision making and free will to be a real thing, I think. Like I think that I think the fact that we can do science is not arbitrary. And I think people, you know, the standard canon in physics would be, well, you could trace all of that back to the initial condition of the universe. But the the whole point of science is I can imagine doing the experiment and I can do it and then I can do it again and again and again all but, over the planet. The, to you, imagination is somehow fundamentally generative of novelty. Yes. So it's not like the universe could have predicted the things you imagined. Imagination, super. so coming back to novelty, I think novelty can exist outside of imagination, but it supercharges it. It's another transition, I think. Mm. I mean, I would say... I mean, this may be a boring statement, but I would say I'm the sure fact there. Sorry, I'm not sure. It's a hard. These are hard questions. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the fact that objects exist is yet another proof that that time is fundamental and novelty exists, right? Because I think again, if you ask a physicist to write down in their infinite bible of the universe, let's call it the Bible, the the Mac, you know, that book. Yeah, well, I mean, <laughs> that I mean, book that we're the, math the, the mathematical universe, whether you're Max Tegmark or I Sean Carroll kind of or Frank Wilczek. <laughs> or, or or Stephen Wolfram, okay? Yeah, uh, I like that book. Yeah, I love it too. It's lots of pretty pictures. It's really interesting that they they cope with the enormity of the universe by saying, "Well, it's all there, mathematics. It all exists, right?" And and I would say that that's why I'm excited about the future of the universe because it it although it is somehow dependent upon the past, it is not constrained just by the past. Mm -hmm. Which is kind of mad. Yeah, that's what free will is. 
It's not constrained by the past. It's dependent on the past. This moment, it's not just dependent. This moment is the past, and yet it has the capacity to generate a totally unpredictable future. I mean, the other thing I would say that's super important for human beings, right? Human beings have actually very little causal control in the future. I realized this the other week. Oh, the immediate future, you mean? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So what happened? The way, so this is what I think it is. The way, <laughs> by reinterpreting your past, I mean, talk about from a kind of cognitive, psychological cognitive point of view, by reinterpreting your past in your current mind, you can actually help you shape your future again. So you, but you, yeah. you have much more freedom to interpret your past, to act in the present, mm -hmm. to change your future than you do to change your future. I may sound weird. So I'm saying to everybody, imagine your past, think about your past, reinterpret your past in the nicest way you can, then imagine what you can do next, or imagine your past in a more negative way and what you do next. And look at those two counterfactuals. They're different. Yeah, it's fast. I mean, Daniel Kahneman talks about this, that most of our life is lived in our memories. And it's interesting because you can essentially in imagination choose the life you live. Mm -hmm. So maybe free will exists in imagination. Choices are made in your imagination and that results in you basically able to control how the future unrolls. Cause you're like imagining, like reinterpreting constantly the things that happen to you. Exactly. So you, the, if you want to increase your amount of free will, those people that have most, I don't think everyone has equal amounts of agency because of, uh, because of our, Sad, sad constraints, whether, whether, you know, happenstance, health, uh, economic, born in, born in a certain place, right? But you're, those of us that have the ability to go back and reinterpret our past and, and, and use that to change the future are the ones that ex exert most agency in the present. And I, I, I want to, I want to achieve higher degrees of agency and enable everyone else to do that as well, to have more fun in the universe. <laughs>